Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the time is now how to build an inclusive financial system for all. My name is Mac Wallace. I'm a fellow and policy advisor at the Aspen Institute uh, on inclusive financial systems. Our intended moderator today, Ida Radebacher, is unfortunately ill. Uh, so I've joined to moderate today's session in her place. We'll be taking audience questions uh, uh, throughout the session today. Um, so please use the chat and the comments feature and use this opportunity also to connect with others um, interested in the subject through the chat function. We chose today's theme on inclusive financial systems as we believe that financial inclusion and financial security at the household level is foundational to creating a strong, sustainable, and resilient economy. We know that an inclusive financial system represents a powerful economic tool. Research from the IMF shows that there is a two to three point uh, GDP difference in growth um, over the long term between financial inclusive countries and their less inclusive peers. And over the last decade, we've seen tremendous progress advancing inclusion. Governments and social sector actors have taken bold actions to elevate financial inclusion on the economic agenda. Uh, for example, through the GPFI at the G20, the Maya Declaration um, by the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, and the World Bank's Universal Access Initiative and the creation of the Global Findex database. And during this time, we've also seen an explosion in digital and mobile technology and the rise of over 20,000 fintechs globally. And today, the formal financial system now serves 69% of adults. With all of this momentum, the reason that we are here today is to recognize that there is still significant work to do. Real challenges remain, and indeed new challenges have emerged as a result of the pandemic, reaching and serving a set of households, uh, a set of households and small businesses worldwide that are disproportionately led by women, people of color, and other historically vulnerable and excluded populations. And while reaching and including these populations is critical, simplistic measures of account access actually fail to capture whether that access is truly enhancing people's financial well-being, their security, their health, and their dignity. So today's section, session is focused on what the next agenda needs to look like in order to advance inclusive financial systems that drive improved financial outcomes for all people and small businesses. And as the world moves from recovery uh, from the pandemic, reshaping our financial systems will play a critical role in ensuring the next decade looks different from anything that's come before. So we are joined today by three colleagues. Together over the last year and a half, we've done considerable work in defining the elements of an inclusive financial system. And I'd like to welcome um, Ash Amin, uh, Victor Malu, and Gabriella Fapata. Thank you all for joining for the conversation today. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure Wonderful. to be here. Uh, Victor, Ash, and Gabriella, to get started, um, describe what an inclusive financial system looks like to you. Who does it serve, how, and, and how does it compare to the financial system we have today? Well, I mean, if I may start, I mean, very briefly, I, I think, well, an inclusive financial system is a system that's available to everyone and serves people according to their individual needs and desires. Um, in an equitable, reliable, um, secure, and transparent way. And um, compared to the financial system we have today, and I'm speaking in Mexico's case, because that's where I'm from and that's where I, I live, and that's the financial system I know best, um, we're still very far away um, from it being available to, to everyone in the terms I, I just described. So the area of opportunity <clears throat> here is, is very big. So I'll leave it at that for now. I think uh, for me to add to what Gabriela has um, mentioned, I think we need to have not just an inclusive financial system, but one that provides impact or has the right outcomes. Because I think for the last so many years, for example, in Kenya, we have focused on access and we started off, say, a decade ago at 27%. Today we are, we are at 83%. So in terms of access, we've had a tremendous uh, progress. But I believe there are issues to do with uh, how useful uh, this inclusion is and what are the outcomes? How, how has it led to improved uh, health, financial health? 
for the users or for the people who have uh, uh, have had this access. So I'll stop there for now. Yeah, thanks, Victor, um, Gabby. So yeah, I mean, to state it, tourism, right? Finance is a means to an end. People leave, lead all kinds of complex financial lives, interact with products, service providers, regulations with each other in this financial system, right? But as um, Victor and Gabby have noted, the system is not necessarily designed to be inclusive or cater to disadvantaged populations. And as many of you know, you know, the focus so far has been on inclusion and therefore access, but perhaps again, not on the outcomes or what we actually get out of it. So a lot of my comments will be, you know, wearing the hat of BFA Global, which is the company I'm with, consulting firm um, where we do all manners of things related to improving financial services in emerging markets. Um, it's been a pleasure engaging with the Aspen Institute, um, with Mac and with Ida and the working group of global practitioners to define what it means right, to, to have an inclusive financial system where success is then defined by the ability to improve financial outcomes of people right, and long-term financial well-being. Um, because we're at a pretty interesting juncture. Uh, wealth inequality is pervasive. COVID still has a bit of a grip, a rather large grip on us. There are the challenges of climate change that are looming large. Um, and all of this makes it more important than ever before, right, to ensure that economic growth is inclusive and that it lessens inequalities that currently exist in the system. So I think as we go through the conversation through the rest of the session, you know, uh, one of the things I'd love us to keep in mind is that there are two goals, if you like, that we're perhaps trying to achieve with this framework itself, right? One of them is mechanically, it makes sure that the challenges we face, because they are so many, they all become tractable under this framework. And it allows us to focus on our areas of strength, kind of like the exercise we went through as a community with SDGs and with financial health and all the other things. But the other one is also a bit of a safeguard, right? It's to make sure that we do the right thing because the financial system do the right thing as we're improving or building out financial systems, because these systems have a profound impact and they have a magnifying effect, right? On both economic growth and inequality. And the role and power of financial systems in facilitating inclusive growth and lessening inequality, it really needs a deliberate sharp focus. So a large part of coming up with this principle and the work of the working group is also that. So we hope that the four principles kind of allow us to reach alignment, but We'd love to hear from the audience as well as we go through the session on what you think. You know, how much have we covered well and what, what is missing? What are the things we can extrapolate this to? That's great. And, and uh, I'll take a moment just to introduce and speak to the paper's four principles and then ask uh, each of our speakers which of, which of the principles they, they connect with the most and, um, and maybe giving an example of their own work. Uh, but uh, the paper's four principles of what an inclusive financial system represents include prioritizing the historically excluded and underserved populations. Uh, number two is measuring success by outcomes. Number three is establishing and enforcing strong regulatory regimes. And fourth is around promoting growth and integrity. Um, opening it back up, Gabriella, Ash, Victor, we spent a lot of time speaking to these principles. Um, which of these do you personally connect with the most in, in your own work? Uh, if I can, sorry, go ahead, Gabriella. Oh, no, no. Go ahead, Victor. Okay, so so for me, I think measuring success uh, through outcomes, I think we've spent a lot of time in building infrastructure, which was necessary. Uh, and for me, infrastructure is like building a highway or a railroad and opening up communities or, or, or villages and towns to form a financial uh, 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 system. But the challenge is how do they leverage it and, and how has it altered their lives? If, for example, they only have access to their financial uh, solution once a week or once a month, you really have to wonder what impact it's having on their lives. But if we could measure this through the ability to manage their day to day, uh, uh, you know, work, for example, how they access food, how they make ends meet, how they budget, how they cope with health, uh, purchase of medication and, and emergencies. Uh, whether they can access a lump sum amount within a short period of time, whether they are able to save and invest in their future. Uh, these are, I think, the outcomes we should be looking at and how does the formal financial system leverage or support them in achieving those outcomes. Uh, so for me, I think what really excites me is moving away from uh, uh, access. Uh, maybe we should have a term like beyond access 
what do we what are we going to achieve after access and for me it's uh, success how we measure success through uh, the outcomes that are, are, are individuals and small businesses are able to get out of this uh, form of financial system i'll stop there thank you well i'd like to i'd like to say that i mean in, in relation to what victor was saying um I think we have also focused very much on the first uh, principle of prioritizing his historically excluded um, populations. But I think that here, um, the access agenda is still important if we're talking about these um, historically excluded groups or last mile populations, because so many people still lack basic access to the formal financial system, you know, but it, it does have limitations. And um, as Victor was saying in Kenya, 83% of the people are not financially included, whereas in Mexico, not even 50% of the people have an account. So we still have a long way to go as regards that just plain access agenda. But I think it's important for us to ask um, access to what, you know, and, and maybe more importantly, for what purpose? Because um, in certain contexts, like maybe... Um, basic access through an account, either through mobile money or, as in the case of Kenya, or through a financial institution, as might be the case of Mexico and many other Latin American countries. Um, having this basic access to an account to only be able to receive government transfers could perhaps be a good enough first step, you know? But I think there would also need to be... Um, there, there, I mean, not, not, not I think. I think th there really needs to be um, close enough and convenient cash out points and um, or widespread digital payments acceptance coverage for that access to be of any use to the recipient. And, uh, well, we also need to recognize that there's a lot of limitations to uh, providing relevant, safe and affordable uh, financial products and services. In, um, in a sustained manner to last mile populations because of challenges in making the business case work for these populations in many countries. So access infrastructure and products go hand in hand and there needs to be a, a business case to sustain this. And that, you know, and then talking about outcomes and, and real good impacts, that needs to be part of the conversation. But I think that, you know, there's, there's still space for the access agenda in, in, in many countries. Sure. And uh, maybe just to add to that, I mean, essentially, I think to answer your question, oh, clearly relate to all four. It's it's sort of one of those exercises where we ask, how do we want to skin the cat sort of and which parts become more important than others? And they're all important. Yeah. And they kind of all show up in different parts um, of different markets, depending on where things are relatively or greater strength or weakness and things like that. Perhaps just by the nature of our work, the kind of professional advisory services we provide um, we tend to focus a little bit more on the first two, perhaps, right? So there's the prioritizing of historically excluded and un underserved populations. And some ways of doing that are making being very intentional around inclusive design, right? Keeping the needs of women, less tech-savvy users, refugees, internally displaced people, um, other disadvantaged portions of different communities in mind, right? Making sure that we have that lens on, um, making sure that capital is inclusive, so a lot of our vendor building work um, certainly comes with this inclusive lens, making sure that um, the capital that is being provided is aware that of the challenges that are going into providing the products and services, and therefore that it's not going to be like um, investing in perhaps an advanced economy. Um, then there's also the measuring of outcomes in a successful way. A uh, big push has been around the financial health agenda. Um, it's sort of our go-to framework, if you like, right, to measure um, customer facing impact and making sure that there is that impact, but not just at the access or outcome level, as Gabby was mentioning, right? It's not just about how many accounts did we use because it kind of goes back to the whole finances, um, a means to an end. And the end is all the good things we want in life, right? It's education and housing and, um, you know, upward socioeconomic mobility and all of that. And we found that financial health is a nice pit stop for that, right? It's to say that, look, if you can create products and services which kind of allow you to do day-to-day -day management of your financial um, affairs well, if you can take care of opportunities or provision for opportunities rather, um, if you have uh, resilience to shock, some kind of safety net 
And if you're able to have control over your lives, right? I mean, just kind of going through the four dimensions of financial health, somehow all of these things seem to have four principles or something. Um, then you can get to something where it's more than the outcome, right? Or it's closer to the outcome rather. And then of course, there's the work around regulatory regimes and then promoting growth and integrity um, around focusing on KYC, AML, CFT, um, uh, consumer protection frameworks and all of that good stuff as well. Um, but yeah, quite, you know, quite a large range of things that get caught with this net of inclusive financial systems. Absolutely. Um, and, and I love how already we've defined a few contours of potentially what a next action agenda might look like. Gabrielle, to your point, access is still important. And, and Victor and Ash, to your points, um, outcomes and new outcomes agenda is also really important too. Um, in addition to public sector, which you were hinting at Ash, um, and regulatory capacity. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear focusing a little bit more on policymakers uh, why should national policymakers care about building an inclusive financial system uh, within their country, especially now? What do you see as the benefits of, of undertaking this work? So if maybe I could go first on this one as well. I think for, for me, it's important for policymakers and government to develop uh, or come up with interventions because marginally or historically excluded communities, I think, will not be accessed through commercial, you know, or commercially uh, oriented uh, 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 programs. Uh, what we've seen uh, in many cases, uh, as for example, in Kenya, is that we've had to have donor intervention or, or development partners coming together with government to support or to, in a way, incentivize uh, uh, private sector players to come in, for example, we set up a social uh, a payments program in the northern part of the country, which is uh, very uh, dry, remote, uh, pastorally. So it was a very difficult environment to operate in. And for a number of years, we had to rely on development partners to, to, to in a way, uh, uh, provide the capital that, that was required to set up agents and also to set up uh, uh, branches to a level where today, the, the you know the, these communities are now financially included and a commercially viable model is able to to provide uh, both social payments plus other you know uh, uh, to include other institutions including small businesses uh, government departments etc so i believe it's important for policymakers to really come up with this uh, i would call them incentives they need to develop policies that incentivize the private sector to to partner uh, with the public sector in order to address uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, long-standing uh, excluded or underserved uh, communities, for example. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, to Victor's comment, I think um, an inclusive, I mean, policymakers should, should care about this. And at the very least, uh, an inclusive financial system, I think, should enable people to um, to have access to social support programs, which, um, as we have seen under COVID, um, that was key to ensure resilience of households and businesses and countries without this outreach were unable to effectively and rapidly reach populations in need. But um, we need to find out also what the limits are of the private sector in serving um, the poor and, and the last mile, you know, and define what role the government should play beyond those limits without distorting markets. You know, I I ask myself how and when governments, um, you know, should be smart about what, when and how to subsidize. And um, I think this continues to be a big area of opportunity. Um, so best practices are welcome from, from the public. Um, because there definitely needs to be a partnership, but, but how does that partnership work? And there are spaces where the private sector is just not going to get there. And um, recently I, I, learned, I, I read an interesting blog uh, about the limits of the private sector in serving the last mile in Africa. I don't know if, uh, if you've read it, but you know I, I recommend it. And, um, and maybe the link can be posted 
in the in the chat. And I think uh, similar research should be undertaken in other markets to guide policymakers to know where they're able to make uh, the most difference in this space. Yeah, totally right. I mean, the, there's a bit of a carrot and stick thing going on here. But generally speaking, I mean, policymakers probably need to get involved because we're taking a systems approach because it is involving so many moving parts, right? And there are stakeholders and interest groups that need to be brought to the table and there are barriers that need to be surmounted. And none of these things could be done perhaps, at least at things are now, if we left it to the market forces. Now, ideally, you know, any solution that we derive, any products that are offered and all of that are market driven, but to get us to that point, um, it may perhaps, you know, whether we want to call it the benevolent hand of policymakers or something, um, there is that role that policymakers need to play, right? And and that's sort of the lowest common denominator, if you're right. But then, you know, there is all the abundance of evidence in terms of why they would want to do that um, in terms of um, a carrot, perhaps, right? So uh, there's this McKinsey study, for example, which says that if all emerging markets were going to adopt DFS, digital financial services, then the total GDP would grow, or the addition to GDP would grow at $3.7 trillion, a huge amount compared to where we are now. Um, there are also all these papers, for example, by Jack and Suri from Kenya, where they've calculated that the spread of mobile money has lifted about a million people out of poverty, equaling about 2% of the population. Right? Um, there's all of this research from the U.S. Federal Bank, uh, I think the Atlanta one, the Fed, Atlanta Fed, as well as the IMF, um, which shows that excess inequality can slow growth. And then also, interestingly, with the current COVID situation, I think we've seen that governments in more than 200 countries have relied on the existing financial system to distribute relief. Now, these systems already need to be there before you can get to the relief. If COVID happens and then you try and set up the system, that's not very helpful. Right. And then I suppose a final sort of, uh, you know, or else kind of thing is that there's also a national security issue, right? Pervasive inequality or a lack of gainful employment opportunities can lead to social unrest, right? And it can lead or it can cascade into an IDP situation or a refugee crisis, right? So there are like this wealth of reasons why I think, you know, policymakers really need to start being deliberate about fostering more inclusive financial systems. And I, it, when I reflect on our work together, I think one of the key uh, takeaways that, that we all had was this intersection with the social safety net um, and how inclusive financial systems don't operate in isolation, but are so interconnected with, um, Victor, you brought up infrastructure around uh, uh, mobile and digital connectivity, for example. Gabriela, you brought up the social safety net in, in Mexico and that's so integral to, to everything going on there as well. Yeah, and, and maybe just to, to add to my comment about infrastructure and uh, safety nets, I think what I, I did not mention is part of the program, what we were trying to demonstrate was also the shift from uh, food relief to digital cash transfers. And looking at it from a market systems approach, we felt that taking food to these communities was not, uh, you know, uh, stimulating the economy. In fact, what it was doing was dampening the economy by giving people, this was in times of, you know, drought or floods. So the, the idea was, why don't we replace this free, if you want to call it food and uh, with cash, and then the individuals themselves can go out and buy for themselves the food relief, uh, you know, purchase medicines, etc., which was actually stimulating uh, the economy as opposed to suppressing it. And I think that's another area where policymakers can come and really drive a shift away from, uh, you know, things like physical, you know, food relief to, to digital transfers that actually support and grow uh, uh, the economy as opposed to, to, to dampening it. I'm going to take a question from the audience here, which I think connects with, with what we're, we're speaking to, which is we've all expressed um, in one way or the other that there are limits to market forces, um, to being able to include and, and serve, serve everyone on the one side. But on the other side, there are also limits to uh, the government being the sole provider of financial services too. 
Um, and so it's somewhere in between uh, where there's a role for the private sector and there's a role for, for the public sector. Um, what the question here from the audience is, is a comment around um, what is the role of government in bringing access to the underserved? Um, and what are different models that you're seeing or um, either private sector models or public sector models or hybrid ones that you're seeing in your respective countries or contexts um, that you could share with audiences here that are joining us from around the world? Victor, I know in Kenya you were mentioning yeah. around um, infrastructure for, for digital connectivity is an interesting yes. one. Yes, so, uh, so in Kenya, for example, uh, again, we have some parts of the countries where we experience very poor network coverage uh, because of uh, various um, uh, challenges, some of them leading because of infrastructure like roads, electricity, etc., and distances as well, and the density of population. And what the government has done is they've created a fund, which is mainly it's the telcos that contribute to this fund. And that fund is used to set up towers in these locations. So a telco can access uh, those funds to build a tower on condition that they share uh, that tower with the other uh, providers. And as I said, the initial cost to me is usually the big challenge. So if you can take away the capex, you might be able, you, you will be able to manage the operating costs. So for me, these are some of the ways where public private partnership can come in and, and really work together. I mentioned before we were running a social protection uh, a program, a food subsidy, where we're using cash. And what we did is initially it was 100% uh, donor funded, but at the end of that, uh, two years ago, we trans transitioned this program, you know, 100% to, to government. And now uh, they are supporting over 100,000, actually 350,000 households in, 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 in the whole of uh, Northern Kenya. So I believe it's possible, you know, to work together. And let me add that this was also public-private because the transfers are de delivered through a bank account. So we were also looking at it from an inclusion angle that you've got these communities included, but they also have uh, social uh, uh, support, not just a safety net, but also an emergency fund. So in case there is drought, they receive, uh, you know, additional funding or if there are floods or any other uh, natural, uh, uh, you know, uh, calamities. So, so I, again, I think it's really important to have this uh, working partnership uh, where the government provides policy, regulation, and incentives uh, for, for the private sector to come in and, and participate. Thank you. Yeah, it's... Um... Quite a long list, right? If we start listing what the governments can do, but it, it is because at the end of the day, um, responsibility for a well-functioning system, right? Kind of making sure that systems are competitive, safe, fair, inclusive, that they you know foster growth, trust, have responsible products. It kind of does fall at the end of the day with the government, right? To make sure that all of those things are there for the people of the land. Um, so some of the things, uh, I think we've covered a lot of it. Victor, uh, some of them as well, in terms of like regulating for inclusion, right? And enforcing codes and standards. You can have standards, but one has to make sure that they are enforced. Um, protecting consumers as well and enforcing that kind of protection through things like GDPR, um, either investing directly or incentivizing private sector capital, right? So Indonesia and India, for example, have um, direct lending requirements for priority sectors to make sure that money goes to the sectors that promote inclusive growth. Um, there are things around uh, promoting partnerships and other kinds of collaborations, right? Backstopping those because left to themselves, maybe those partnerships would not happen. Building critical infrastructure, right? Building switches um, and things like that. Or in Latin America, the credit card network, right? Different distribution systems work in different parts of the world. Um, maybe even going in and providing the necessary services. Um, if private sector is not willing to go and do it, then the government kind of does what it needs to to the extent that it does and then gets out of the way, right? So yeah, no, I'd certainly encourage folks to check out the paper because there's a fair bit of thinking or a fair bit of detail that's gone in with examples on what the six or seven things I think where that government can actually focus on um, in terms of this. I think maybe just to add another maybe interesting uh, component of social payments in Kenya is that the government has zoned the countries into zone A, B, and C. 
And depending on the financial services provider, the commission or the fee that is paid for transactions within the zones is differentiated. So to me, this is incentivizing the private sector to participate in the more remote locations. So if you're paying social payments in the capital, say Nairobi, you will earn maybe a dollar per transaction. But if you're in zone C, which is, uh, you know, the remote uh, locations are bordering, say, Ethiopia, Sudan, or Somalia, then you earn a dollar fifty. So there are ways which uh, the government can also, using financial uh, incentives, because we literally looked at the cost of delivering uh, uh, these transactions in different zones and arrived at, you know, the average cost. And, you know, based on that, there were some uh, recommendations that were made, but then through a competitive process, uh, various financial service providers were contracted to deliver these uh, 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 payments. But again, I'm just saying that it's, it's the way the model was done was structured in a way that would incentivize the private sector to participate because they, we, we felt that if the price was the same, you know, like in most countries, ATM transactions or, or mobile money transactions are the same wherever you are. But we felt if we did that, then they would only be in the urban and the peri-urban locations and would avoid uh, going to the rural uh, or more remote locations. But by creating a tariff that had a price differentiation, we were able to actually have you know, institutions rushing to the more remote locations to try and acquire uh, uh, beneficiaries so that they could uh, service them and earn uh, the you know, slightly higher uh, commission. So again, I think it's, it's really how you model it, how you implement it. And I think policy plays a part, uh, a huge part in this. Um, we have a, a related question from the audience here. Um, we've focused a lot on the public sector and, and incentives. Um, and the question here from Denise is, how might fintechs best be incentivized to support inclusion? Um, she continues, often as startups, their goal is to gain big clients to support their growth. And those big institutions are often focused on those where the profit lies, which is um, higher income individuals typically. Um, and I, and I, I'm smiling a little bit because I, this is a topic that we talked a lot about in, in our working group um, that left to its own devices, uh, private sector, uh, uh, and, and other institutions focus on where the profit lives. Um, so flipping it a little bit, how, how can we incentivize fintechs or other financial institutions um, from, from growing their population base and, and, and serving the more, more vulnerable or excluded? And these would be the public sector too. What, what role might they have too? Well, yeah, a, oops. No, please, Gabby, go ahead. On the government side, I mean, I think it's it's up to those governments to provide the enabling environment and regulation that allows for fintechs to participate and compete and, and grow. On the other hand, you have their funders. So how patient is their capital and how how much are they really allowing and enable these fintechs to, to serve populations that have been previously excluded? And um, and here, you know, I refer back to the the blog that I was that I was mentioning before. So, what are the limits of the private sector in serving the poor? When you need to you need to show results, you need to grow. Your your funders have certain expectations. So, as long as your fintechs are caught in a world where they're you know they want to go deeper, but they really can't because they have to respond to donors. I mean, to funders who um, are expecting certain returns, that you know that is problematic for for fintech. So the government can do its part to set up the enabling environment. Maybe I mean, in some instances, it's more enabling than in others. But assuming that it is there, um, how deep can they go? And is that their their role to go deep? And this article is really interesting because it talks about. Um, people's discretionary income and at what level of the socioeconomic ladder people have more or less of this discretionary income that they can use to maybe benefit from um, digital services and at which point you can't. And then whose role is it to include those people who cannot be 
included by you know, the private sector. And that's where, you know, the whole conversation about where does government come in, which is also a tricky question because sometimes governments go a little too deep, then they don't know when to get out. They often also distort markets. Then there's, you know, political agendas and things like that, which makes things a little uh, complicated. So um, that's still a question that, I personally don't really have an answer to, but maybe Ash can uh, bring some insights to the conversation. Well, well it's um, thanks, Gabby. I mean, it's almost like fintechs are the as opposite of a stakeholder as you can imagine, two governments perhaps, right? But um, you know, in an increasingly digitalized world, we have no choice but to make sure that fintechs are under this tent with all the other inclusive financial systems providers, right? And many are already there, and I think, you know. It pretty much comes down to making the point that doing good is good for business, right? Um, we have this Catalyst Fund pro program, which has a couple of different um, strands or siblings, if you like. And we've been working, I think, close to 50 startups now over the last 50 years, uh, 50 years, uh, 50 startups over the last five years. Um, and um, pretty much all of them have something around being inclusive with happening with them. And the way we achieve that is by having the conversation around product market fit. The markets that you're operating in has individuals who face all of these inclusion related challenges. To get to a proper product market fit, it therefore means that you, they have to essentially address those challenges. Because if you're not, then you're certainly limiting yourself to the upper middle income or the high net worth individuals, right? And it does turn out to be a perfectly tractable problem. It is possible to find product market fit, not just in the financial arena, so credit and savings and payments and insurance, but also ancillary services as well, which actually are inclusive in nature. I mean, it's almost like going back to the conversation around, you know, the proverbial fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, C.K. Braulard's book, right? The idea that um, providing nugget-sized services or customized personalized services that are small ticket can actually end up creating as good as or even better of a business case um, and for fintechs, you know, because they're bringing the tech and the data and the nibbleness to the equation, they can make a business case out of it even better than incumbents have been able to in the past. So for, for me, I actually have some sympathy a little for fintechs because what of my own experience has been this, this sector is what you might call a slow burn. Uh, you need to have some long-term, you know, uh, investment. Uh, or should I, I, I th think Gabriela put it well with patient capital, uh, because if you are looking at net contribution, you know, margins, they might not be that high initially. Uh, so it takes, it may take a while. So what I've noticed is that the larger, more mature institutions that have other parts of the business that are fairly profitable, are more in a position to invest in financially excluded uh, communities because they then have other parts of the business sort of supporting the overall business until the inclusion starts to pay off because it does eventually. But again, we could also argue M-Pesa was a fintech and now they're, they're, they're you know, a, a hugely uh, profitable, uh, uh, actually the most profitable uh, institution, I believe, in Eastern Central Africa. So it is possible to do it, but uh, yeah, that, that, that would be, it, it really requires uh, some patience and, and, uh, and a fairly long-term uh, uh, financial uh, you know, horizon. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, you all have shared some examples already from, from your countries and your own personal work. Um, I would love to give you all a additional opportunity to share uh, what actions you are already taking or intend to take either as part of your personal work or the organizations you work with uh, to build a more inclusive financial system. Um, and I'll just share and, and kick us off here at Aspen. Um, most recently, we, we've been working and focused on um, joining the 50 plus other countries around the world that have a national financial inclusion strategy and commission um, with most recently U.S. Senator Chris Coons um, joining in the chorus of establishing one here in the United States. Um, and a lot of data shows that there is a connection between commission and coordinated action in the federal level um, with more inclusive outcomes for people. Um, so here at Aspen, that's something we've learned from our international colleagues and have been translating here back into the United States. Others? 
So with, with FSD Kenya, we, we are looking at a number of areas. One, uh, as I've mentioned before, we're looking beyond access and usefulness, for example, is a new way that we're uh, addressing this market and also trust, uh, because what we, our research is showing that uh, there are challenges or there are issues to do with trust when it comes to using the formal financial system. And we're looking at how we can uh, address that. As I mentioned earlier, also looking through outcomes, the issue of uh, financial help, and how does inclusion support someone's ability to manage their day-to-day -day liquidity requirements? How do they manage their risk? And how do they invest for the future or for the education of their children, etc.? So really looking at it from an outcome point of view. Uh, we're also looking at uh, post-COVID, uh, you know, building back better. How do we support uh, the, the individuals as well as SME and uh, MSMEs to, to rebuild uh, uh, their businesses? And, uh, and then also we are looking at the last mile. As I mentioned, we are at 83%, but we acknowledge we still have some uh, pockets of exclusion. And we are doing research to really understand clearly why these uh, 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 communities remain excluded and we want to find solutions that can be able to to reach uh, these uh, marginalized communities thank you and well if, if i may mention a, a project that i'm participating in which is also with bfa global so ash knows about it really well and uh, with the support of medlife foundation um, the name of this project is FinSalude, and it is um, a three-year project focused on measuring and improving um, the financial health of low to moderate income Mexicans um, in a very cost-effective uh, and efficient way. Um, so we're seeking um, to bring outcomes measurement um, mainstream um, here. So what we've done um, is we developed a uh, financial health index to be able to measure it. And then we also developed like a digital clinic, a financial health clinic um, that enables financial institutions and companies to deploy surveys and also to provide um, recommendations related to um, how to improve financial health. And uh, right now we've been working initially with um, credit unions or SACOs which we call financial cooperatives uh, to develop the tool and the use cases, because these are financial institutions that are already serving the populations that we care about. So we didn't have to convince them to go on market. They already have a business model for that and everything. They're not very digitized. So that's a, a bit of a shortcoming, but it, it has, you know, th that has not prevented them from being able to do the, the surveys, the financial health survey. And um, what we're working on right now is um, to develop um, like a white label version of this financial health clinic as, as a public good. So it'll be um, readily available to anyone who wants to use it. And even though we are, we're initially designing it for financial service providers, um, companies and impact focused startups and fintechs and academics and other agencies such as BFA, and even government, you know, can deploy this tool and learn about um, the financial health of uh, their customers, their employees, uh, their beneficiaries, and and obtain um, actionable data to be able to improve it. So we're working on that right now. And that's a project that we're very excited about um, here in Mexico. So we we as we move forward, we'll be sharing more information about it. Yeah, it's a fascinating one. It's, uh, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it kind of thing, right? It's, um, and so this is a serious effort to make sure that provider agnostic or even consumer segment agnostic way, you know, we're able to measure um, eventually what we want to address. Um, and maybe a couple of quick examples. I mean, as you can imagine, uh, because we kind of work across a cross section of different areas, just all over the financial services segment on um, customer research, supply side interventions, you know, future proofing incumbents, venture building support for fintechs, data science, strategic planning, and all of that. I mean, there are many examples, but I thought of um, maybe two or three that perhaps um, uh, stand out in their own way, but also with perhaps more of a gender focus or gender lens, because that is also something that I think a lot of us uh, spend a lot of time making sure we do right, right? So one example is around platforms, right? Platforms, as we have come to know over the years, 
um, is uh, they can be great accelerators for all kinds of solutions. And if we look at e-commerce, it's a great accelerator for small businesses and launch pads for commercial success. Now, those who are less tech savvy, those who are rural, usually are not able so much to take advantage of that. So one of our projects is in Bihar, working with women-owned enterprises and collectives to make sure that there are linkages to those markets. And the results we're seeing there are around uh, 3 to 10x of revenue compared to when they were not linked, right? So huge case to be made for onboarding folks onto e-commerce platforms. Um, another example could be around gig work, right? It's a type of livelihood that has um, exploded, especially around COVID. It's somewhere in the middle of formal and informal. And we all know the pros and cons of it. You know, it's flexible employment. It's great. Second source of income. But then the perils as well. Lack of benefits, fluctuating income, you know, need to go beyond just getting payments, bad working conditions and all of that. Um, so we're working with, in China with delivery drivers with an app, again, focused on financial health to a large extent on the WeChat platform. And the idea is to make sure that the interactions that they're having, financial and otherwise, do contribute in some way to their financial well-being. But also with a focus on women delivery drivers, because traditionally they only make up 10% of the delivery driver population. And perhaps the third one, you know, if we're talking about systems, at the end of the day, there is the bigger picture, if you like, but also there is the creating of the leaders who are going to change the system and affect the changes that we want to see. So one of our recent works was with a philanthropic foundation, taking a critical look at women in leadership positions in financial services, right? Because the thesis is that if there are more women in power or in positions of power and responsibility, they will contribute to empowering and mentoring more women who end up in similar positions of power and responsibility. And it becomes a virtuous cycle, right? But there are certain um, institutional barriers and all kinds of other barriers. So this was a very sort of critical look in terms of why are we not there yet? What do we really need to fix with large amounts of discussions with on the ground um, individuals in, in multiple countries? Um, and then, of course, there are initiatives okay. like these, you know, massive thanks to Aspen for setting this up and Mac and Ida for leading this conversation around um, inclusive financial systems. We're involved in similar ones with the UNSGSA, for example. There was a session yesterday on financial health, which is sort of like a sister um, initiative to this. Um, and then there's also this focus on pushing the envelope to what's coming next, right, with COP26 just wrapping up. There's this whole focus on climate change that we have re, um, which we call it, um, uh, you know, recommitted ourselves to, right? Climate change has always been there. It's been a challenge. We recognize it, but I think this is an opportunity for us to redouble our efforts there. Um, and so we're sort of leading this um, task group, which is focusing on digital finance for climate resilience. Right? There's been a lot of work on adaptation and mitigation. But it's also time to look at resilience in, in a big way and see how digital finance can, um, you know. And I realize I've been going on for a little long, but just one last point. But I think part of it um, is also making sure that we're honest with ourselves. So in to whatever extent we can, and I would say this to all of the other professional service providers who are on this call and who may be looking, listening to this video um, or this session later, we have to be honest with ourselves that with every project we do or with every initiative, that we're actually having some modicum of impact towards an inclusive financial system. So, you know, for what it's worth, like we have this setup where every time we take on a project, we have four or five questions that ask, is this actually having a positive impact on X, Y, and Z stakeholders and all of that? And then when the project ends, there is a retrospective and there is a soul searching session essentially, right? We're a small company, but we want to do it right. And so, you know, things like that, like there are all these different levels that we, we can play and contribute to, to getting, you know, closer to an inclusive financial system, I guess. Wonderful. Uh, for those in the audience, please start sharing questions if you haven't already done so. Uh, we'll be opening it up <clears throat> shortly for, for greater Q&A. Um, perhaps as, as we look forward here um, and, and you think about uh, what actions others can take today um, to also advance the principles of an inclusive financial system. What's your call to action to those listening in today? Um, and, and what are two or three uh, between us actions that they, they might be able to take to advance this work uh, going forward? So for me, what comes to mind are two or three things. One is about collaboration. 
Um, I believe this is a, a challenge that cannot be solved by any, you know, one or two individuals or even one or two institutions. And from what I've seen is when you bring various uh, stakeholders together, uh, it works well if there is uh, cooperation and collaboration and people are, you know, are ready to roll up their sleeves and really uh, tackle the challenges that come with building inclusive uh, financial systems. The second thing I would want to mention is, I would call them the soft issues like trust. I think it's, 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 it's interesting when you go to a, a focus group and you ask them what are the issues that you're facing with the formal financial system and you expect them to say, oh, it's the distance to, to my service provider or it's my app on my phone, but they tell you trust. We have issues uh, around trusting this system and we prefer cash because cash is final and there are no issues about reversals or fraud, etc. unless it's counterfeit. So I think there is an issue around how we continue to build trust in formal financial systems to a level where um, uh, individuals who may not be that literate or educated as well are able to rely on it with a high level of, of confidence. Um, the final thing I'd want to mention is around, again, usefulness. I think we, we, under, we, we understate, uh, you know, I, I think the M-Pesa story has been told over and over again. But I think for me, the first use case that they had, which was send money home. And we had many Kenyans who live in the urban areas who needed to send money to their families up country. It was an easy sell. It, it wasn't something that you needed to, I don't think they even advertised. I think by word of mouth. People said, oh, there's this new, you know, way of sending money up country and that's, and it just picked up like wildfire. So I think if we can solve the problems of the excluded communities, we won't have to drive inclusion. It will happen because they will be the ones demanding it. But if we sit, you know, in, in boardrooms and develop solutions and better and better widgets and saying, now this is the widget that is going to solve the problem. I think we will not uh, achieve what we are setting out to do. Finally, finally, I think we need to look at issues to do with consumer protection and financial capability, because these are some of the areas I think that will impact or that will improve inclusion, because I think the systems are advancing at a fairly rapid rate, especially in Africa, but maybe issues to do with consumer protection have not advanced at the same uh, pace. So there is a need to 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 have this also catch up uh, with the solutions that are being placed in front of uh, uh, consumers. Uh, so consumer protection and financial capability are other arms that I think we may have sort of left behind, and we need to uh, go back and pick this up and make sure they're advancing uh, at the same pace as innovation and and uh, financial solutions and inclusion. Thank you. Um, I guess my, my, my personal call to action would be um, at two levels and more focused on, on institutions, let's say. Um, on the one hand, at the ground level, um, I would like to encourage financial service providers like banks and credit unions and MFIs and fintechs um, to give themselves the chance to learn how measuring and improving um, the financial well-being of their customers um, can work to their advantage um, in relation to um, customer retention and improved customer lifetime value, um, as well as you know their corporate social responsibility agendas. And I would also like to um, encourage companies, particularly well maybe mid-sized and larger ones, to do the same with their employees. Um, I think the Financial Health Network in the U.S. has done a lot of work um, in this regard. And there does seem to be a business case for financial health. Um, also, I think the Commonwealth Bank of Australia has actually published um, about this. So that would be one call to action um, at, a, at a local level. And at a higher level for like global players like the World Bank or the Alliance for Financial Inclusion and even Aspen, um, I would like to see a push like there was for financial inclusion with uh, the Maya declaration back in the day about a dec over a decade ago um, to to develop 
and apply a sort of um, index that measures how inclusive a financial system is, um, starting with, with a baseline. Um, and perhaps this can be guided by Aston's report. Um, I would, you know, I, I would, this would hopefully uh, prompt like action uh, to identify gaps in financial systems inclusivity levels at a, at a country and a global level and, and to define and to help define um, specific agendas for for the next decade. So I'd leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Yeah, maybe piggybacking off of a comment made in the audience. So someone said that protecting consumers should extend to stopping predatory marketing to vulnerable groups, as well as promoting irresponsible spending like buy now, pay later. Absolutely, right? I mean, this. Uh, I'm going to extrapolate that to making the point that policymakers really have to make an effort to get ahead of the curve. Uh, digital solutions, especially when it comes to money, have a way of running away from us, right? They go and do a lot of things and they break a lot of things and we're left uh, cleaning up the mess over the next few years, if you like. Um, we really need to get ahead of that as much as possible. Um, we're seeing the issues with digital credit already. Digital currencies are a reality and cryptocurrencies are becoming mainstream. I mean, the amount of havoc that could be wrecked, but as well, the amount of promise that they bring, right? So we always would want to be on the right side of that balance. And so I think this is one where we'd love to see policymakers, you know, getting ahead of the curve a little bit. Um, related to a point that Gabby made, I think also there's a lot of value in uh, both fintechs and incumbents, however we describe them, at looking at partnerships, right? Fintechs are, they come in with the tech, uh, the digital, they are very agile. And incumbents have that footprint. They're already serving hundreds and thousands, if not millions of customers. They have an army and all of their staff to go out and effect change. They have brand recognition. They know their customers. And uh, the sum of the parts there, you know, should really contribute to something um, impressive. And we perhaps don't see as many partnerships as we would like to see. And it's somewhere where we feel like we have a lot of value in terms of playing that matchmaker um, instead of folks trying to do it alone. And I think the last um, thing I'd love to leave the audience with is to say that if you have time, I would encourage you to check out this piece by Tim Ogden, who was part of this working group as well, uh, FAI, called The Great Convergence. Right? There is one thing we don't do as much of. We talk about North and South and knowledge transfers and things like that. But what we're realizing essentially in the recent past is that underserved populations in the US and other advanced economies are pretty much facing very similar problems to populations in emerging markets, right? Around income volatility, lack of steady jobs and all of that stuff, um, you know, small business finances and whatnot. And so there's a lot to be learned from both parties and the solutions to kind of jump over that north-south barrier, if you like. So yeah, great con convergence and a great conversation to be had there as well, perhaps. Um, Mac, back to you. I think we just have a few more minutes. Excellent. Yeah, and, and these papers mentioned, uh, we'll share them in, in the chat here. Um, which I, my understanding is it extends beyond just the session itself. Um, so, so we'll post those links there. Um, and so wrapping up here, thank you to our session speakers, Ash, Gabriella, and Victor. It is always a pleasure. Thank you for joining this crucial conversation and for advancing inclusive financial systems in your own work. Um, and thank you to our organizers at CFI as well. And thank you all for tuning in today. Um, you can learn more about inclusive financial systems at Aspen. Um, through our profile here within Financial Inclusion Week, and also by visiting www.aspenfsp.org. Um, and you can download our report on inclusive financial systems that we've been speaking about today and get started supporting a more inclusive financial system in your own work uh, and in your own country. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having oh, us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.